Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review at longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show, and please, will will you please uh, give a warm welcome to a returning guest, a favorite of yours and mine. It is George from the Meanwhile at the Podcast podcast. Hey, George. Hello, Eric. Hello, everybody. Eric, I'm ready with my previews here. This is the right. <laughs> this is the right episode, right? <laughs> This is the right thing we're doing here. You know, some people who uh, who listen <laughs> to the show would definitely love to hear that that is the the uh, the, the subject of this episode. But alas, that is not the case. Oh, great! So this will be a shorter episode, only three and a half <laughs> right. hours. Okay, great. All right. Well, I don't know about that because uh, today uh, George is joining me uh, to talk about three wonderful books. Uh, I would say, George, these are these fit the term graphic novel. Yes, like most trade collections that we we generally talk about on our individual shows and sometimes together fits that that moniker so much better than those do. So um, yeah, we're we're actually going to be talking about three books from Humanoids Publishing. Uh, is that right? Publishing? It's Humanoids anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to be talking about uh, Hedy Lamar and Incredible Life, and then the Twilight Man, Rod Serling, and the Birth of Television, and then finally something I mentioned, George, in my favorites of 2020 episode, Marilyn's Monsters. So we're going to talk about those three, and the reason we're doing that is during San Diego Comic Con at Home 2020. When everybody was shut down, but San Diego went ahead with their their Comic Con online for all of us to to enjoy. Uh, there was a humanoids panel that I remember watching um, uh, because Mark Wade joined humanoids, and they were they were basically just talking about uh, the various books and stuff going on with you know in, uh, in terms of the publishing end of humanoids. And that got me that got me really interested in some of these books. Now, also on top of that, uh, speaking of previews, George, you constantly would uh, mention some of these humanoids books, I, as I recall during our our, our uh, past previews episodes. And so all of that just got me thinking. Oh, it'd be really nice to read some of these. And then I discover, and I, and maybe my memory is a little off, but I I, I seem to recall that I watched this this humanoids panel. And then for some reason, maybe I was just looking for something else. I went to comiXology shortly thereafter, or, or maybe they even mentioned, I think, no, I think that's what it was. I think during the panel, they mentioned that, that, uh, they were having a humanoid sale at comiXology during the panel. So I'm like, okay, after that panel was over, uh, I went to com, uh, comiXology and they had a bundle of books, 25 first volumes. And uh, so I bought those, and then I think I I tweeted something about that, and uh, and that's where George's part of the story comes into this. Yes, because I saw that tweet, and of course it fished me in. <laughs> I because I, I am a fan of humanoids books. I have a couple. I'm not much into the digital game, as anybody who listens to my show knows. But that price, which I don't recall what it was, but I mean it's basically the price of one book. Or, you know, it was, it was obscenely low. Yeah, it was really cheap. Yeah. I mean, and it was almost like you would be stupid not to do, it. especially if you had any interest <laughs> in, even if you had interest in only three of the books and then you were willing to maybe only sample another three, you got your money's worth just from the one that you read. Yeah, I think, I think it was twenty four ninety nine. So I think it was 25 for, for, so basically 99 cents per book. That would and, make sense, mm-hmm. and and some of you know in the case of uh, Maryland's Monsters, I think that's like a two hundred and sixty page book. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, far more pages for that volume for ninety nine cents than you'd get with any DC or Marvel trade. Ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was it was it was a, it was a very good purchase, um, and then <laughs> the story <laughs> continues, folks. Uh, within a week. Of me buying these this this uh, Comicsology bundle for twenty the the, the twenty five first volumes, I <laughs> discovered that Humble Bundle was doing a humanoids bundle. That's how they get you? Yeah, 
Yeah, and and there I spent, I think, actually less than I spent on the Comixology bundle, and I got 100 files. So uh, some of the some of the books that I got, none. I think that's no, no, none of those were part. The the three that we're talking about today were not part of that. No, no, Twilight Man was. That's right. Uh, the other two were not. But uh, you know, I I got uh, multiple volumes. So some some of the some of the titles I got, you know, three, four, five, six volumes. So to equal out, like I said, a hundred. So I am. I have a lot of humano- humanoids books to read through. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to buy anything else all year. <laughs> That's pretty, 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 pretty true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. ECBS is not going to like you. <laughs> oh, believe me, I still, I'm still buying a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. Uh, George and I had actually have been talking about doing this episode for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, although I think the scope of it may have changed over time, George, because we were going to talk about uh, like. Just talk about the, the the ones that we read. And up to this point, I've read, let's see here, 1, 2, 3, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, at least 16 of these Humanoids books, whether it's the Comixology or the Humble Bundle versions that I got. All right, you have me beat because uh, I didn't buy the Humble Bundle. I I drew the line there, even though, like you said, it was you could do it for cheaper and get more. Mm-hmm. Knowing that I don't read digital that much, I know it would be, they'd be just be sitting there. And I, I, I know the argument, folks, <laughs> it's not taking up physical space. What's the big deal? Mm-hmm. But I, I just didn't do it. And um, I'm, I'm fine with the volumes that I have for now. And out of the original bundle that Eric described with the 25 first volumes, I have read eight of them including the three we're going to talk about. Yeah, I think the other... Th- uh, so I, 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 what I want to ask George next is, uh, of those of those, of those books that you have read, you know, besides the three that we are going to talk about, what are, what are yes. some of your favorites out there? I have three of them, and I think all three of those actually... Uh, again, I don't... Now I don't remember. At least two of them are from the Comixology bundle. Um, hmm. So... Yeah, I, it, either way, it was it was a, it was a good purchase for me for sure, um, and uh, yeah, I, lots of really good stuff here. Uh, but I but I see a pattern for the most part in terms of my enjoyment of these humanoids books. So I'm really curious if you uh, went down a similar lane, so to speak, in terms of the the type of stories that you gravitated towards in 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 what you liked. So what hmm. were what were some of the other books that uh, you you have quite enjoyed? Well, since there are only five others, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm just going to ramble them down. Okay. I'm just going to okay. going to go down the list. Uh, one was Chasing Echoes by mm-hmm. Dan Goldman and George Shaw. Now that one I had the hard copy of prior to this uh, this digital deal that you made me aware of. I also read Carthago Book One. Yeah, I've not read that one. Okay, now that is a book that I don't think I would have ever given the time of day to if I saw it on the shelf. I mean, I had seen it advertised in previews over time. The artwork looked beautiful. Just didn't seem like the type of story I'd be interested in. And I was wrong. I liked it. It was it was a good story. Uh, I also read Barbarella, Volume 1. I, I read that one too. John, yes, uh, adapted by Kelly Sue DeConnick from the, the original text and, and obviously the original art. Uh, I enjoyed that. I had no idea what to expect. I enjoyed it. What did you think? Uh, actually, I don't remember too much about it. I, I, okay. cause this was a long time. <laughs> this was, this was almost a year ago that I probably read that one, George. Mm-hmm. So I, I honestly don't remember. I, I remember really liking the imagery in it. I do too. And the thing is, I, I guess I'm feeling my oats these days as much as I, I'm not too much into the new stuff from DC and Marvel as much as I'm into new stuff from other publishers, but I do like going back to the history of comics. And I was always interested in that even when I was younger, but now as I'm getting older, I like to visit things that I know nothing about. Mm. And Barbarella, while I'm familiar with Barbarella as a character, I never even saw the original artwork <laughs> for for the original book. So, I, as as a as an exercise in, in historical reference, it was good. But I was pleasantly surprised that again 
the artwork was beautiful, but I liked the story. It was fun. Mm. I just had a good time reading. Now, don't ask me details. I'm like you. I read it about a year ago, but I just remember enjoying the experience and wouldn't have minded had I went with the Humble Bundle. I'm guessing maybe volume two might be in there or maybe even a volume three. So I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past myself to try to seek those out at some point in the future. Uh, the other things I read were Shanghai Dreams mm-hmm. and Louisa Now and Then. Ah, okay. So you have mentioned my three already. Oh, so yeah, okay. So good. which ones were your three? Yeah. So uh, like I said, uh, Chasing Echoes. I think that oh, was okay. Just now. Oh, that was the second one I read. The first one I read when I started started into this this uh, let's let's read some humanoids books uh, was Louisa Now and Then because. Mm-hmm. That book has to do, and so this is by K- Carol Morell and Morel. Mariko Tamaki. Uh, yes. So Mariko Tamaki was was a draw for me because I'm familiar with Tamaki's work elsewhere. Well, she, she just adapted it, though. almost oh, right. like how Kelly Sue DeConnick, uh, you know, adapted the the translation of Jean Claude Forrest's Barbarella. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You're right. But this is it's it's a weird time travel coming of age story. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. very different from from you know because I I I think because uh, this is this was French uh, story right from a French I author. believe so I didn't I didn't really write down too many details yeah that, I think so because right. uh, that that was one of the things that I that I that I that I kind of bumped on was the the way that uh, different cultures tell stories sim you know familiar stories but they tell them in in, in different ways than what yes. we are used to as as um, ignorant Americans um, <laughs> are used to to uh, engaging those kinds of stories, so I, I was I was it was very interesting to me, and it's this is that's a book that I really need to go back and reread. I agree. And then uh, you mentioned uh, Chasing Echoes. That was my like I said that was my second one. That was that you know that came really close to being on this list, or oh. uh, for for our episode tonight. Because it was such a good story about family and history and the connection mm-hmm. to to uh, World War II and yep. um, uh, just the fam- like I said the family dynamics is just really interesting and yeah it, it was like in some ways it was kind of like it reminded me of my own family dynamic stuff mm. in some cases and, and other, in other ways it's totally different but but familiar anyway right and so yeah. that's that's just wonderful storytelling. Uh, by by the creator on the, uh, on that or creators I I forget now who you, who'd you say who who, uh, who did that one George uh, Dan Goldman and George Shaw yeah there we go okay mm-hmm. and then uh, you mentioned Shanghai Dream as well mm-hmm. uh, this is by Philippe Thoral mm-hmm. and Jorge so. Miguel mm-hmm. and it's so funny because it, in some ways there's a lot of overlap uh, in some of these books right because Shanghai Dream is also set during. Uh, a war. It's World War II, right? As well. Yeah. 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 It was. And I believe when I was reading this, I was reading other things that had to do with the war. Uh, and even Chasing Echoes, like I said, has the echoes of the war. And I think they even put on social media, probably in a tweet, knowing me, that for some reason, I hate war. I hate violence. Yet everything I had been reading for about a month, <laughs> a month and a half, all had to do with World War II or some other yeah, war. Yeah. Yet That's the true. stories were so compelling mm. uh, that, that I just had to keep going back for more. Yeah, yeah, and 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 not just World War Two, but but there's the whole film make, film making aspect mm-hmm. of Shanghai Dream that you know perfectly uh, aligns with a lot of what we're going to talk about mm-hmm. for the three books that that we are going to talk about because all of those, Hedy Lamar, Mar- uh, Twilight Man, and Marilyn's Monsters, all have to do with Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that I, it, you know, that I don't know that it was necessarily, it wasn't planned on my part <laughs> in terms of <laughs> talking about these three. It was just out of all the books, uh, these three are probably three of the best that, uh, that I think we've read so far. I agree. Plus it, it's good to have the focus and the focus is these are three books about people that I think the majority of your listeners know. I mean, maybe, maybe not everybody knows who Hedy Lamar is, mm-hmm. but if they don't, if they don't get it, they're not. May, they may not get it from our conversation, but I would suggest checking out this uh, this book. And hey, there's a thing called the internet. Google, find out who she is. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I I went down a rabbit hole with a lot of these things, George, uh, mm. as I was 
preparing my notes because I, I'd read something in, in the book. Wait, notes, and- notes. Hold on a second here. Wait a minute. <laughs> I've got 10 pages of notes, George. I don't know about you. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, but, but I would, I would come across this information. I'm like, well, that, that seems important, but there's no, uh-huh. you know, they didn't explore it more. There's no context. And so I, I was Googling a lot. I was go- uh-huh. mostly names because I wanted to make sure is, so is this, is this a person or an actual person? Or is this like a, you know, a conglomeration of people, you know, how sometimes they do that with nonfiction yes. works. Where, right. where, they, where is the author taking liberties? Yes, and exactly. Where, where, where's that fine line between reality yeah. and, and the taking yeah. of liberty? And oh my God, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to the, 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 the last book, but I, the stuff I did not know about all of these people mm-hmm. that it's just, it's amazing uh, what all three of them accomplished in their lifetimes, yeah. um, given the adversities they faced. I, it's, yeah. it, it all of these, all of these people, inspiring and and uh, noteworthy for their for what they contributed to to uh, our entertainment. Uh, yeah. Let alone the impact to the culture that they've had too. So it's just <laughs> it's it's amazing. So we'll get into some of that as we as we get into these. But it's just like wow. Uh, before we before we move on, I, I just want to say, like I said, these are humanoids books, but they are all part of, and I think all of the ones except for Louisa. I don't know about some of the other ones that you mentioned, but they're all part of uh, the Life Drawn imprint under humanoids. And so Life Drawn, that's, you know, just about its biography or autobiography or whatever. So um, really good stuff, though. Uh, uh, the Life Drawn series, though, I, I did I did write this down, George. Uh, it features graphic novels focused on diverse so- social themes by different creators. I would certainly agree with that in terms like, say, Chasing Echoes or Shanghai Dream, mm-hmm. uh, or even Vietnamese Memories as as well uh, that I read. I haven't read that one, but that, that one is the next one in my queue. Mm-hmm. But, Did you read yeah, that one? Uh, I haven't finished it. I, I'm oh, okay. almost there. Almost there. Yeah. But uh, uh, I, boy, I, I definitely will keep an eye out in uh, future previews for for any new books that I don't have digital copies of, uh, and maybe even a few as they, as they resolicit them for the, for the, uh, hardcover, hardcover editions, because at the very least I will buy one of these three books, uh, and it will be on my shelf in my library for sure. And you talk about, uh, ones to read in the future. Um, uh, I just bought count, which is not a life drawn, but count the, uh, futuristic, uh, view a, a futuristic retelling of the Count of Monte Cristo. Ah, I, I want to get that one. Uh, and I have ordered MPLS sound, Minneapolis sound, uh, based on, uh, there's going to be a Prince vibe in, in there. And I'm a, I'm a big Prince fan. So mm-hmm. once I saw that solicited, I didn't even have to really read the <laughs> synopsis. It was in order. And I have Sirens of the North Sea coming. So I have three humanoids books pretty much ready to go. They're going to be hard copies. Ready, pretty much ready to go that I'm very excited to read. Good, good. So, George, what drew you to these three particular books? What, why did you want to talk about these? I have been a sucker for a, a, a while now for these biographical graphic novels. There is something about them. Now, some may call me lazy because <laughs> if I was really interested no, in- No, they'll call you find, George. <laughs> well, you know, if they- <laughs> I've said this before. I'll say it again. A lot of people in my circle still don't understand why I read comics. Even the people who I read comics with back when I was young. Uh, why, why are you still reading those things? Yeah. Why, what's with the funny books? <laughs> and th- those would be the people who would call me lazy and say, hey, you know, if you want her to really read about Eddie Lamar, there's a biography about her. Mm-hmm. It's in prose. You just go to your local Barnes & Noble, <laughs> order it online, whatever. <laughs> or Marilyn Monroe or Rod Serling or whatever. And, and that's all well and good. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to do that. But there is something about sequential art and the graphic medium that I love and seeing somebody's life story, especially nonfiction, laid out the way that these books are laid out. I just love them. I, so since these biographies were there and these are people who I'm interested in learning more about anyway, they they just were must read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and I you know it's it's just 
for me, it was kind of happenstance in terms of at least two of these books, uh, just because I, when I started reading stuff, I was drawn to them because I knew of the actresses mm-hmm. and, and of course, um, uh, Rod Serling. Uh, and so, like I said, I, I read them because name recognition and then sure. coming out of the books, it's like, oh, wow, these are, these are fantastic. And and while the other books that I mentioned are great themselves, these I think are like cream of the crop so far of everything I've read. So that's why I chose or wanted to talk about these books. All right. So what? Uh, uh, let's see here. Do you want to give like a, a, a your overall impression for each book? As well, I tell you what. Let's let's do that. Let's just start with Hetty. We'll 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 do it. We'll do a, a, a brief. Um, what do we think about it? And then we'll start into the book, and then we'll do that for each one. How about that? Sure. But I, since you were originally going to ask for an opinion on each, I will give an overall opinion and say, since I read these almost upon purchase, I had to reread them for us to record this show. So this is a second reread, but months in between and i have to admit i don't reread many things but i appreciate rereading these because i think i got more out of them oh yeah and even though there was such a normally if i have this even just a couple of months in between reading something sometimes it's almost like oh i'm reading it for the first time because i totally (laughs) forgot everything which you know for subtle details sure I, i didn't remember a lot of things but I started to, maybe because I was familiar with the story, I think I appreciated the art more than I did the first time around. Mm-hmm. And it did kind of flip my favorite around. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. For instance, if we had recorded this originally when you and I had planned last year upon getting these bundles, I might have a different, I might have had a different favorite. But now I think the one that I like the least in terms of, the artwork i'm not going to say the entire package but i guess the artwork i've changed my mind and now it's my favorite okay uh, 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 let's just let's just talk about that then uh okay. let's not be coy with our listeners anymore okay because uh, i've been kind of talking around it too so what is your favorite book alan's Mont. yeah yeah mine too and I think what was what was turning me off it was the art style is so different when you compare them to the Twilight Man, yep, uh, to the Rod Serling book and the Hedy Lamarr book. Mm-hmm. Those are more tr- traditional cartooning. In fact, I would say maybe Twilight Man might be considered more in the vein of uh, m- maybe more like a big two ish book. Mm. It's it's definitely uh, it has a more modern sensibility in terms of its its uh, uh, construction and um, uh, visuals. And I would consider that that might be the most accessible for Mm -hmm. people who only know superhero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I would agree. So yeah, when you you get to the other ones, it's, it's a bit jarring. (laughs) Yeah. And then the Hedy Lamarr book, again, the cartooning is great, but it's, it's still at a, in the traditional sequential format that I think we're all familiar with. It's just a different style. Yeah, it, it uh, in in large part, it kind of reminded me of like the New Yorker cartoons. Yes, or, that is a or uh, something comparison. you would see in a in a in a uh, a high end magazine or mm-hmm. or even comic strips that that kind of a style. But 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 so much more ornate, so much more detail to it. So yeah, then Marilyn's monsters. Because I I had seen Marilyn's monsters solicited in previews for a while. Finally got it as a result of that bundle that you were talking about. Excited to read it. In fact, I think it was the first thing I had read. And I think I was disappointed in the artwork because there's a grotesque yes. nature to it. Yeah, yeah. And I was a little confused at how the story was presented because, mm-hmm. A, I didn't think it was going to be biographical. I thought it was going to be a total fiction piece. And it it was really more of an amalgam. Well, I don't know. Is it allegory? I don't know what to. I'm, it, it, it's a biography, yet it does throw that little bit of the fantastic in it, yeah. which we're going to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, as I think I was focused on the story 
when I originally read it and almost ignored the art because it was a, a little it taking me taking me aback a little and maybe turning me off. But this time around, I focused on it. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, when you put the two together, which is what is the magic of graphic novels, comics, sequential art, that is the magic. Oh, yeah. So it took me the second reading to appreciate the package as a whole. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it bumped Marilyn's monsters ahead of Twi- Twilight Man was my favorite, I think, out of the three previously. Now I would say Marilyn's monsters is way way uh, yeah yeah and i would way surpassed yeah. and, and and in fact okay so uh i had a similar reaction to you when i first read Mar- Marilyn's monsters in fact when i looked at the cover of that mm-hmm. um with with her really simplistic but exaggerated uh figure on on the cover um i i was like what what are they trying what kind of a story are they trying to tell here uh-huh. And, and yeah, I was, I, I will admit, I was, at first I was kind of put off by, by the art, but then you get into it and yes, uh-huh. it's, there's, it's biographical. Uh, there's some element of, of fantasy, I'll just say. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then that, that wonderful merging and amalgamation and discovery that is art and words on, on the page and basing actual events with a little bit of extrapolation. <laughs> yeah. And have, having about halfway through the second read, which was done only a couple of days prior to us recording this, I kept thinking to myself, why didn't I think as highly of it mm. upon the first read as I'm thinking about it now? Mm-hmm. So it, I definitely appreciate reading all three of them again, but especially Marilyn's Monster. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, in fact, I would say, uh, out of the three, before I was doing more, uh, doing the reread of all three of them, Hedy Lamar was probably my favorite at at that point. And then I read, I I I, I reread Marilyn's Monsters quickly so I could talk about it during my favorites of 2020. Mm-hmm. But then, it, like like you just said in preparation for our discussion, I I just reread it. Uh, just a few days ago, and oh my god, the my appreciation for this book is just shot up. Uh, you know, I would I would give this. You know, if we were if I were to give it a, a score, mm-hmm. I, I'd give this uh, an eleven out of ten. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there you go, folks. <laughs> and I'm trying to pretend I'm not being biased because I know, as a right? Marilyn Monroe fan, right? But I just can't, oh, you know, you know what's it. you know what's funny about all this. Um, uh, obviously, I've seen a, a bunch of Twilight Zone episodes because you know that's it's wonderful mm-hmm. science fiction and fantasy uh, that you know that I watched when it was in syndication. I don't know that I've ever seen a Hedy Lamar or Marilyn Monroe movie all the way through. I may have seen scenes, oh. uh, definitely of, of Marilyn Monroe, but now now I have to go watch some mm-hmm. of their movies just to see the actual person doing their art. So, okay, there we go. So that, that's our, <laughs> that's, that's, our preamble. That's, that's the show folks. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how we feel about these books, but, uh, right. but now we're going to talk about some, uh, some details about each one. So we're going to talk about Hedy first, Hedy first, Hedy Lamar, an incredible life, which was published in 2018 uh, mm-hmm. by humanoids. This is by William Roy and, uh, Sylvain Durange, I, I want to say, with Montana Kane doing the translation. And uh, this is what, uh, this is the, the the book blurb. And I have to say, George, these are long, long blurbs uh, that uh, Humanoids <laughs> offers, which, you know, I guess it's it's not a bad thing necessarily, but I'm I'm used to reading much shorter things. <laughs> is this what we have, would, would we have seen this in previews? I don't, or, I, I, do, I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking okay. not, maybe, okay, maybe it's part too of long. it. But yeah, it, okay. se- it seems too long. But I pulled these mm-hmm. off of the, the the humanoids website. But it, but it gives you a good overview of what this book is about. So we don't have to do that. <laughs> okay, so Hollywood icon by day, unsung science genius by night. Yes, folks, I I read that correctly. If you did not know, from her native Austria to the limelight of Hollywood, Hedy Lamarr was constantly bombarded with societal limitations and personal obstacles, including her own beauty. Only through courage, ambition, and intellect would she rise to become both a cultural icon and an unparalleled inventor whose creations would alter the course of history. 
Creators William Roy and Sylvain Durange used the graphic novel medium to recount the biography of a genius inventor who happened to be, quote, the most beautiful woman in the world. Which, George, I, that is probably the only thing I knew about Hedy Lamar going into reading this book, is that I, I had heard through, you know, whatever pop culture ingestation <laughs> or in my lifetime, I, I knew that about her, but I, I had no context for it. From a childhood filled with curiosity and ambition, despite the stereotypes imposed on her, to an abusive marriage that she ingeniously escaped from, to finding her way to stardom in the City of Angels in the face of rampant sexism and harassment, Hedy Lamarr would not only become a glamorous star of the golden age of Hollywood alongside icons like Judy Garland and Clark Gable, but also an unparalleled inventor. She would fashion designs to revolutionize the planes built by Howard Hughes and come up with a secret communication system that helped the Allies against the Nazis. How many people can say that? Uh, A technology that would become the blueprint for what we know today as Wi-Fi. A visionary that never feared going after her goals and defied convention at every turn, Hedy Lamarr was a true woman of wonder. Boy, was she. Uh, George, I have here uh, just, I, I decided to pull some critics' quotes as well for each of these books. And so this is from Publishers Weekly about this book. Uh, and Publishers Weekly said about Hedy Lamar, the book is entertaining but focuses too much on the sexist forces Lamar dealt with, never fully establishing her as a personality in her own right. So, my first question for you Do you agree with that assessment? It's interesting that's what they focused on, although I will say this. Uh, I was After you were done with all this, I was going to say the, the other common denominator with these three books, besides for them being biographies of famous people, uh, actors and actresses, is that I think all three prove that men are scum. <laughs> and yes, yes, not, yes, and not only that, and, and not only that, but it also goes to show that it doesn't matter how much time goes by. We as human beings, as, as woke as we want to pretend we are, we don't change. Mm. Because there were so many things that I saw in all three of these books that paralleled things that are going on today. Oh, yeah. But in truth, men are scum. <laughs> Uh, so I can especially, under- especially Hollywood men. Yeah. Oh, Hollywood men. Oh my God. And, and businessmen in general, it seems. Well, like. yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, that's what I should have said. Yeah. The businessmen oh are the worst. Oh my God. And so I, I'm not surprised that this critic focused on that, but I think they did ignore the bigger picture. I, I agree. It, that, that, yeah. that, that was just a, that was just a part of the bigger whole. And it's almost like they ignored 80 per, the old 80 20 rule. They focused on 20% and ignored the other 80. <laughs> but I mean, it was there. What they're describing is there. Yeah, but it just yeah. seems like if, if that was truly their full critique, then they missed the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you? I, I, I pretty much agree with you. I, 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 I do feel like, though, that uh, the, the authors of this book uh, did miss getting delving into certain things about Hedy Lamar where the, where it was kind of discussed on or shown on the edges of her mm-hmm. lifetime or her personality but they didn't really get into like the subs what I would think of as the substance of it the meat mm-hmm. of it um which is maybe the only drawback to this whole thing because I never I never really felt let down by this book In any way, uh, it could just be that, you know, it was her life was just so fascinating to me and to find out, you know, she was more than just the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, you know, she, and she, she definitely created her own success, but also her own downfall in some ways. Mm -hmm. But like, again, they didn't really get into that. They just kind of showed it, uh, um, and not, not really digging into it. So, but I mean, there's just so much to. What so a large part of the book, and maybe now this is this is where we can just kind of jump into talking about some some highlights that we read, but there was just so much of her past that 
that really pushed her to do certain things, right? And and got her to where she needed to be, or not needed to be, but where she ended up in her life, right? And and so they they talk about they talk about this uh, in terms of her her marriage or her, her childhood. So I, I wanted to start there, George, because it was refreshing to me to see. So this was this was she grew up bef- uh, in the in the year. Well, she came of age in the, in the years leading up to World War II. So I yes. think I want to say I have to pull up my book here on my tablet. <laughs> I'm trying to see if there's an actual year for for when they start in her. Well, they would they start when she was five in 1919. Okay, thank you. I I couldn't I couldn't. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you're right. 1919. Yep. And then in 1929, when she's 15, and like you're saying, comes of age. You know, that's Hitler is mm-hmm. making his move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of the things I loved about this though is the her, her father uh and how he he was really open to Oh yeah. to uh basically feminism and and uh allowing her his daughter or or not allowing but but giving her the space to explore what she wanted to and 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 um help her a- along in her journey. You know, because she she did she invented something when she was fifteen. I forget what it was now, but it was very early on that she was she was thinking of of how to make things better or or to create things out of out of that were that weren't there before, right? right. Um, despite the fact that <laughs> you know her father had a uh, apparently had a, a fascination with with machinery and how things worked, and there's a scene in early on in the in the, in the book where he's explaining the combustion engine to her. And this person, uh, they encounter this one older man uh, on the street and they have a quick conversation. And uh, uh, during the course of that, I think, I can't remember exactly, but Hetty says something about about the, the car or, or the engine or something about that. Anyway, but so so this guy is just really patronizing towards her and and says but automobiles are for boys and then basically pats her on her head and <laughs> and 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 uh says something about her being a pretty girl mm-hmm. uh, and yeah <laughs> it's like oh my god yeah, uh being a father of daughters i have i have i have a few daughters that just that really rankled me uh seeing seeing the way that uh hetty was what am i trying to say here dealt with not dealt with uh the way that she was approached or talked down to that's what i'm trying to get to talked down to by that guy and uh, uh here's a here's a here's a quote from uh from the father here about uh what i was talking about in terms of how progressive he is about this um he's talking to some person i can't remember the details about that but he but he's like i'm thrilled by this new post-war emancipation and by post-war he means world war one uh, at this point, post-war emancipation that our young people can take advantage of. Young women in particular have gained real freedoms. Uh, they speak more openly. They know what they want. They're no longer shy and prudish. And then we see some panels of Hetty out with her her, her girlfriends, uh, enjoying life, making out with, with, with a guy, looking at motion picture magazines, you know. And then that's what uh, I think what gets her interested in she wants to she wants to be uh or wants to make movies and this is where we really get the the hetty lamar i think that we see throughout the rest of this book because she um manipulates her mother into writing her a, a note uh where she can be excused from school for something i forget now what the pretense was but what she's doing is that she goes in and alters it instead of one hour excuse from school she pencils in basically writes in that she gets 10 hours away from school and then she goes to i think uh a nearby local maybe in the next town i forget now but uh but she goes to this place where they're making movies and she's like i want to be a script girl for you and um the guy's like what experience do you have basically she you know she has no experience but but her 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 attitude and her perseverance pays off because you know he tells her come back come back tomorrow or come back again and she does and and it just so happens they're shooting a scene but they they need more people they need more extras but they don't you know they don't have the people or they don't have the money to to pay them and look there's Hetty and she's she is beautiful 
and she's another person they can sit in the background and that launches it right and then she goes to her later she goes to her parents and says i want to be in the movies and right how many how many times have we seen that 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 story play out you know in our popular culture right right and the parents are like uh what <laughs> <laughs> and the mom's like, basically, the mom's like, "No, you're not." And and the dad, I love this again. Uh, I love the dad. I I I, I kind of wish we had more uh, 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 about the dad between the dad and and Hetty than we do uh, because of this relationship. Let's see here. The dad says, uh, "Let it go uh, to the mother. Our little Hetty will go back to school on her own terms once this whimsy is passed." Hetty says, "I'm very serious," and dad's yeah. like, "Good." Then you can take. Then you can approach this idea seriously and take acting lessons. And so he's like, "All right, well, mm-hmm. I know my daughter, and she's going to pursue this no matter what. So instead of instead of pushing her away by telling her no, I'm going to help her along. And and uh, I, you know, it's not said here, but <laughs> he's going to keep an eye on things too, right? Because that's mm-hmm. what that's what a good dad does. Exactly. So, but then. Uh, <laughs> The next scene we get in this is, and this is one of the things I love about the presentation of this of this book, George. So the the, the book uh, started with what was I, I forget what year it was, but the Hetty's appearance uh, on the television show What's My Line, and right that uh, opened the book. That op- yeah, right. And so mm-hmm. we're seeing it as if we're watching that on television, and then it, then it opens up as if we're actually in the studio, right, with it. Mm-hmm. Well, they do that throughout this book, where we get glimpses of things or or bits of story are told because we're seeing them through the lens, literally, well, not literally, but figuratively, <laughs> through the lens of the camera of of the movie uh, Ecstasy that she was in. Mm-hmm. And so that was, I think, her first starring role, uh, a movie from 1933. And so we see a few, uh, a couple pages of her in this film, giving an idea of what the film was like. And then it get the 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 camera is flipped, and now we see Hetty with her parents in the theater watching this movie. <laughs> And and uh, and if anybody, if you don't know this movie Ecstasy, you can maybe extrapolate what <laughs> this this movie might be about. But uh, this movie, uh, and I didn't know this until I read this book and I, I did a little bit of research. Um, this movie Ecstasy is known as having, or at least is credited as having the first non-pornographic on-screen orgasm. And Hetty was the one doing it in the movie. <laughs> So a bit scandalous for 1933. <laughs> oh, to say the least. <laughs> and well, and I would say I would even extrapolate out that further. It's a bit scandalous if it's your daughter, no matter what time mm-hmm. it is. <laughs> and you're sitting there next to her oh, yes. in the theater. <laughs> and and I don't know if you notice this, George. I, I this is wonderful. That panel. Uh, this is on page 34 mm-hmm. uh, in my digital edition, anyway. So we we just see her uh, basically naked form. And the, 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 like I said, the camera's flipped and we're seeing every, we're seeing the parents and Hetty mother, mother's eyes are wide. She's got her hands up to her face going, oh my, you know, basically, oh my God, dad is pulling on his tie <laughs> away from his neck. Right. Cause he's, he's, he's a little hot under the collar and poor Hetty, where is she looking? At her dad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, that that's why I say I wish we we could have had a little bit more in this about about their relationship, mm-hmm. because you know obviously Hetty adores her father and wants his approval, but she, you know maybe her ambition mm-hmm. she she bit off a little bit more than she could chew in this one perhaps, but she's also not she's not disturbed by the reaction of the about the film. She's more disturbed by her father uh, that I think maybe she feels like she hurt her father in that, in that moment, she, but she doesn't seem to care about her, how her mom feels about it at all. I don't know <laughs> if you picked up on anything like that. I didn't think of it, but you're right. Although I, 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 sh- I should, I should say, you know, this is, this is from the dad. So the, the, the next page shows all the negative press, uh, of this movie. And, uh, he says another scandal surrounding an actress. Our name is synonymous with lust in every tabloid in this country. <laughs> uh, 
And now it's in the German press, too. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah, the film's been banned, he says, due to our Jewish roots mm-hmm. in Germany. So that's where we start getting. And then, yeah, then we, as, we, as we move forward, uh, Hitler's rise to power and the impact to Hetty's family uh, starts to become more known. At this point, though, she's she's um, actually she's acting and meets the guy who becomes her husband. Oh, uh, you know, I obviously didn't know who she was married to over time. But when I saw this guy into the picture, I'm thinking to myself, this guy of, oh my, she's too, well, she was young, but still, she should have been smarter than that. But, you, you know, you can't put yourself in somebody's shoes, but that guy, I mean, as, as a, what's the word I'm looking for? As, as cartoony as the artwork may be, like you say, like a New Yorker cartoon, that guy disgusted me so much. Oh yeah. Yet, you know, he, you know, he's drawn like a, you know, a great cartoon character. He's got that look, you know, the jaw, you know, the square mm-hmm. jaw, mm-hmm. but he's the weapon supplier for the Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, the, the the scene in which he comes to the family to court Hetty, uh-huh. he compliment he gives flowers to and compliments Hetty's mother, and Hetty's uh, looking on, arms crossed, and says, "Herr Mandel, have you come to ask for my hand or my mother's?" Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Why did she marry this guy? I, I assume you know the, the that that's what young women did at that time when they had a suitor of of this man's stature. Despite sure. what we, you know, what we find out about him later, Th- third richest man in Austria. Or yeah, like you know that? this. This, yeah. you know, he was a catch, and yeah. uh, given that her name, at you know, given the context that we just talked about, her name is probably not uh, well regarded in certain mm-hmm. social circles, right? So maybe she felt some pressure. But but see, this is exactly the problem, uh, or or not not the problem. Uh this this kind of feeds into the publisher's weekly criticism about um uh never fully establishing her as a personality in her own right. Because we don't we don't really get things from her perspective here as to mm-hmm. why she did certain things like this. Why why marry this guy? Right. Right. And so uh, this this is probably one of my greatest criticisms of this particular book is that there's a huge swaths of, of her history and and things that happened to her that's just kind of glossed over just so they can get the highlight, hit the highlights mm-hmm. of this. Uh, so this is 174 pages uh, of, of a book. So given that we go basically go from when she's five to after her death. <laughs> There's a lot of room to cover, so uh, it's understandable, but also at the same time, I kind of wish they would have had the opportunity to flesh out some of this stuff. I'll agree with you there. You know, since we're going uh, chronologically through the book, I, I, I don't want to gloss over the full page, front page of the newspaper announcing uh, Hitler becoming the new chancellor in Germany. And the reason for that is, and this is what I was alluding to before, uh, j- j- just to give you an idea, folks, of how we're sometimes we as human beings aren't very smart. We let history repeat itself. I am going to read the first couple of lines in this headline, which I'm guessing he fa- <laughs> the author found on mi- microfiche. I'm not sure. While everybody thought he'd grown weaker these past 10 years, Adolf Hitler has achieved a powerful comeback in very little time faster than anyone else in German history, thanks to support from the right, yada, yada, yada. I don't think I need to say any more to show you how something from eight decades ago, nine decades ago, might parallel a little bit of what's been going on well, in this country yeah. over the years. E- even abo- you know, above, above the headline um, is a quote from him, the task before us is the most difficult which has faced German statesmen in living memory. I, yeah, mm-hmm. That sounds uh, sounds a little familiar from uh, about four years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> men are scum. We as humans don't learn anything from the past. And history is doomed to repeat. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sorry. So. I, it, it, these are the things that also popped into my head beyond any sort of critique of, of uh, things that might be left out, glossed over, artwork, uh, plot, story, anything like that. Just seeing how we're the same. We don't learn. We just don't learn. 
but to continue with this, uh, it it takes it takes her father's death to spur her on to escape uh, this this uh, marriage, which she calls a golden prison. Mm. You know, she 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 took some lovers um, when she realized that this guy is not the the dream catch. <laughs> that uh, I don't know if she thought he was, but but he's definitely not. And so uh, that that causes her her de- her father's death causes her to okay I'm out of here, and she just leaves. She she mm-hmm. arranges it and comes to America. That and uh, while on the ship, that's where she meets uh, Louis B. Mayer, which was who was the head of MGM. Oh, but, but but before before we get into that, that escape though was crafted in a way like you'd see in a in a spy. Thread. Oh yeah 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 exactly yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just, I, I mean, he, he was really keeping her under lock and key with the servants watching her and all his lackeys uh, checking out her every move. I mean, that that was something that if that were made, if this portion were made into a movie, th- this would be a very tense part of the movie. There, there's even a point in here where he has recorded her mm-hmm. trying to convince a guest to take her away, to help mm-hmm. her escape, right? And... um and so she she set this plan in motion, and then uh, her husband comes in with a record. Mm-hmm. So he's recorded her on on this record already. He's done it in real time, apparently, and then he puts it on. You know, do you mind if I put on a little music? And it's mm-hmm. and it's and it's the recording of her talking to this guy. So that's you know that's when she's like, oh, I gotta I gotta get out of here. But yeah, you're right. That whole scene where she she convinces her handmaiden. Yeah, I guess that's what that that woman would would be called mm-hmm. to help her escape. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, th- that was that was a pretty tense scene in this book. But yeah, I I I just again, I how she takes when she finally puts her mind to it, how she takes command mm-hmm. of of her life, her, of her situation. It's just it's so impressive. So she met uh, Mayor. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you on that. I just had to throw that in about her escape plan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is where uh, again we the you know the whole sexism part comes in, especially yeah. in Hollywood. And Mayer is just oh my god, <laughs> you know he's. Let's see, what did he say? Well, what's funny is she he doesn't want to hire her. He says we can't hire you because her ecstasy film. Yes, there you go. Would would be a scandal because he wants families to come see his movies. Yet he's ogling her the whole time. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. of course, the irony isn't lost on her that. Oh, and in fact, I think she even says it. I think it's part of this where she says, Americans, how can you be so puritanical and obsessed with sex? <laughs> yeah, I had <laughs> I had that in my notes, too. Yeah, that was funny. And once again, we don't change as Americans. That's yeah. kind of the way people look at us. Yeah, he, he did say to her, you're very witty, my dear. <laughs> and better knockers <laughs> than I'd imagined. <laughs> as he stares directly at her chest. Mm-hmm. And he uh, asks her to do something about her quote rack end quote. Yeah, and mm-hmm. not just then. Uh, at least one more time in this story, oh. if not a couple more. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she and Mayor are on the ship, so this is her her last chance to convince Mayor to sign her on to to actually uh, work with her and make her a, a movie star. Right. And let's see. He says his wife. Yeah, his wife says you look a little like Barbara Lamar. And I, I, I meant to look up Barbara Lamar. I think I did. And I did I don't think I saw a picture. I was trying to see if there was some physical similarities like like they say here. Anyway, he says we'll send wire immediately announcing the triumphant arrival of MGM's newest star, Hedy Lamar, the most beautiful woman in the world. So I don't know mm-hmm. I don't know if this is if this is true, you know, it's apocryphal or what, but it's but it, it's a nice it's a nice uh, uh, image or nice situation that they th- they threw her in here. What I thought was interesting in his character, and I'm, I don't think this is a stretch to believe that something like this happened. She had originally oh, turned yeah. him down and regretted turning him down. That's true. You're right. Mm-hmm. And going on the boat, that, that that's why that was her last chance to get back in with him. But he was too proud to even though he recognized that she could be the next big thing he was too proud to ask her again so and that was supposedly told to her friend by his wife 
to, to kind of solidify that, yes, he, he mm. is interested in hiring you, but he's not going to come right out and ask you. So you kind of have to <laughs> enable your way to make it seem like it's his idea or, or something like that. So, and, and that's exactly what she does because his pride w- won't allow him to do that because he's the big business man. Mm-hmm. You turn me down. I'm not going to come groveling to you. Yeah, that's exa- exactly right. Um, I, I like how he's in the, there's the, the, these next few pages, George, where he's building her up, you know, mm-hmm. he, she's going to be this big star. Right. And, and what we see, of course, and this is the magic of comic books is that we are seeing what actually did happen mm-hmm. while he's talking about it in the past, you know? So th- I love that, that juxtaposition of how comics can accomplish that. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I will transform you. You'll be on the cover of every magazine. Uh, Hedy Lamar, Queen of the Land of Dreams, forever immortal. Nobody will forget that name. Uh, they will worship you. And then there's this wonderful panel of the planet Earth uh-huh. in front of the sea of stars behind it. And he's, he's, he's saying, you will shine like a star in the night. And I'm going to come back to this because there's something at the very end of this book that bookmarks this particular scene. So, but then he has to undercut it uh, by saying, "Shame about the small rack, though." Yeah, right. There you go. Okay. And, and and her her glare is hysterical. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, it, she is she's just amazing that you know that she being the the strong willed woman that she that she was that she. But she still knew she had to put up with that crap. Right. Like she said, and like millions of other women have said, she had to work twice as hard to prove that she had a brain in addition to her looks. Mm -hmm. Just because she was a pretty face, she had to work twice as hard, if not more. And do it in heels. (laughs) Right. And this, this this little twerp of a guy who runs a movie studio, she's got to impress him and do what he needs needs done. So yeah, she she begins her career in Hollywood, um, doing some films. Uh, she gets married, has kids, but it's when she meets up with uh, Howard Hughes first of all, because Howard has an interest uh, and also a, a weird interest actually, <laughs> uh, and but but has the means and the money to uh, help her realize her inventions. So they they kind of team up and and she. She uh, uses his, 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 like I said, his money and his resources to uh, come up with, what was it, uh, basically a, a powdered cola. So that she's trying to come up with this fizzy drink uh, that people can mix in with, with water, I guess. And, and that, would be, that, that would be their cola, right? Which didn't apparently go anywhere or wasn't good enough. And then also, I, I in the in the in the book blurb that they mentioned that uh, she she also contributed to Hughes's airplane designs as well. They didn't really cover that in the book, though. No, not really. I yeah. I was kind of surprised when I read that. It's like, well, uh-huh. if you're going to mention it in 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 the the book summary, then maybe you ought to have it in the book too. But maybe that's something they just had to cut or something. But then it's when she meets uh, George. I want to say Anthel, Anthel, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. who is a uh, a composer, a pianist, that they hit it off. And an amateur endocrinologist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, because he and in- she invites him for dinner because, well, what is it? What is it about? Well, I think I think she invites him for dinner because he he did something with player pianos where he had them, he had a bunch of player pianos sync up and, and play this, this, the same uh, music at the same time, which at the time was a marvel. Yes. And the way he did that was using, you know, player pianos have the scroll with the, with the holes. And I, I know there are technical terms for this, but basically it's a scroll with holes and the holes are placed properly so that the music will play. And that fell in line with, an idea she had for an invention, but but we don't get that at first because at the at the little dinner party, you know she she engages him in conversation, uh, Mister Anthel, and I'm addressing the endo- endocrinologist here. What do you think of my breasts? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. And they have this whole conversation. You know, he even admits 
they seem fine uh, a bit on the small side. And she's, <laughs> and she's taking notes. Go on. <laughs> um, and so he gives a, a kind of a scientific uh, evaluation of her breasts. And mm-hmm. she's like, can they be bigger? Yes. Bigger than this. And she, you know, pushes her breasts together to show the, the size. And, she, he's, and he's like, mm, yes. And she says, all right. And then that's the end of dinner. There you go. Right. And- right? So, but then you're right. Um, that opens up the door. And I think right. that was that was her way of impressing him and and luring him in because really what she wants to talk about is is the 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 syncopating syncopated uh piano situation mm-hmm. that you described right because she has this idea and so they work on this for a while and the idea is here what what do i have in my notes here about this uh it is oh you mean what the invention is yeah oh yeah here we go she wants to, so she has this idea of frequ- uh, basically frequency hopping to avoid torpedoes being jammed by by uh, by enemy combatants, right? right? And so she thinks that what he did musically can bridge that gap to this idea of actually realizing the idea and making it work, which they mm-hmm. end up doing. Spoiler alert! Mm-hmm. <laughs> but see, and that's that's the other aggravating piece of this when just a couple of pages prior the medium the movie mogul is talking about her breasts the size of her breasts and how that could be a detriment to her movie career she she is this person's intellectual superior by so many exponential degrees and yet he's the one that this this little squat businessman smoking his cigar thinking he's king of the world is the one who holds all the cards yeah. and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. And, but, but that's the way it is in the world, unfortunately, even, even to this day. And here she has to prove herself. And even this guy doesn't even, uh, I'm not the musician, but the media, uh, you know, the movie mogul couldn't care less about her brain. And, and again, meanwhile, she's smarter than this guy. She has more brains in her pinky than this guy has <laughs> in his whole body. And that, and that's the other aggravating part of I me. Mean, how many times have we heard the story before? Uh, I want to call your attention, George, because I wanted to ask you about this specifically. So there is a scene on page 115 okay. where she's she's preparing for uh, a scene in a movie, and they've got this board. She's got a two-by-four, it looks like, strapped mm-hmm. behind her, and they've got these little um, stars coming off these wires, right? To and and you know from the front, it looks like she's got all these stars dangling around her. Right for the movie, uh, Siegfried Girl. Yeah, Siegfried Girl. I yeah. mean, I'm sorry, Siegfeld Girl. Sorry. Zieg- oh yeah, yeah Zieg- you're right. Oh, you're right. Yep. Oh yeah, they, they mentioned uh, Judy Garland as a contemporary. She was in the movie with her, along mm-hmm. with Lana Turner, and James Stewart. Yeah, a movie I've not seen, but I I definitely will be checking it out now. But but they show you what it actually looks like, and she looks uh, angelic, and I think that's kind of yeah. what they were going for in there. But that's not that's the, actually not the 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 panel I wanted to point you to, George, because a few pages later, this is I'm uh, we're I'm, I'm looking at page one nineteen, okay. and this is the actual mechanical illustration of the their invention of uh, uh-huh. Lamar and Anthill's invention, the frequency hopping hopping thing, and. What we have going into this, so music has been playing throughout several pages here of of this scene, and we get some some verses and the musical stuff which ties into the whole frequency hopping piano so lots of lots of callbacks, lots of tie ins to stuff we've already seen right and then we go to page one twenty and we get a full page shot of Hedy Lamar in this in that get up that I described in the movie that, and she just looks gorgeous in this, the stars all around her. And the, the very top of this page, part of the song lyric is you stepped out of a dream. And mm-hmm. again, the, how, how comic books do, do that, that, uh, that juxtaposition of, of image and text and, and idea, right here it is. But what I, what I also want to, want to ask you about here can almost see it as a montage, right? It was, it's almost like one of those montages yeah. from an eighties movie. And this is one of her iconic costumes. Uh, one of her iconic outfits. 
highlights from this movie yeah mm-hmm. right here so that so to have that uh it it's just it just it, you're right it's just amazing how the artists uh, put it all together so like i said there's there's the 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 uh the mechanical drawing and the the lyric there is you stepped out of a cloud as if you know where do I- ideas come from they come from the ether mm-hmm. the cloud right. I, and and dare i say you know the cloud the internet which mm-hmm. came out you know uh, or at least the 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 use of Wi-Fi for us mm-hmm. to connect to the cloud. You know, it's just like all these little connections, right? Well, I didn't make that connection. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's probably nothing uh, <laughs> uh, worthwhile, but I just thought that was really, really curious and, 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 and a, a lovely way of expressing some of these ideas and in, in aggregate. So, and uh, later on, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna skip around, George. So if there's things that that uh, you want to touch on, please do. Well, you're gonna talk about the Navy, them them presenting the idea to the Navy after it was patented. Are you gonna talk about that, or were you skipping that? Uh, that is the next thing. Yeah. Oh, so okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. But again, just to show the 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 non forward thinking of the people in charge. Uh, in order to describe what they were presenting, when Hetty was giving the details as to what their invention does, she mentioned how many combinations of uh, of the the frequency hopping would take place, and it happened to be eighty eight because that's how many keys are on a piano keyboard. So she brought that up so that it would almost like dumbing it down for her audience. But what they did is they focused on oh. Well, how are we going to put a piano on a torpedo? Or how are we going to put a piano in, in the torpedo room? <laughs> and, and all they really needed was a, a way to say no to the two of them. But that was what they focused on. Meanwhile, she's trying to dumb it down to explain it to them. And what are they focusing on? The part that makes them look dumb. And I'll bet you that's exactly what happened, if not some variation of that happened as they presented it to the, to the Navy. And what did they tell her to do? You're, you're a big star. Use your looks, sell war bonds. Mm-hmm. See you later. Bye. Thank you for, you know, thank you for playing. Uh, get your consolation prize, uh, your, you know, your supply of rice aroni and the, and the Navy home game and see you later. Yeah. What I found interesting about that, that scene, George, too, is so, you know, you, you mentioned the thing about the, the player piano and a torpedo, right? That, that just that dismissiveness, right? Of, of those yeah. men mm-hmm. and, and Anthel erupts. Right. Mm-hmm. Here, here's this usually quiet guy. He's just like, that's not it. They don't get it at all. Right, and he's, exactly. he's starting to go on. And she simply touches his arm while staring at at the, the Navy guys as they're saying to, to them, it's a unanimous no. And it's just like you you can just you can just see the the resignation, the acknowledgement from her. She knows there's no point. Yeah. There's no yeah, point in, in protesting in trying to convince them anymore mm-hmm. because she's 10 times smarter than anybody else in that room. She already knows mm-hmm. the outcome of the situation. So, but okay. What do you think of then? So they say, you know, use your beauty, help us sell war bonds. And she's mm-hmm. like, that's what, that's what I will do then. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how did you, how did you feel about that, about her resignation to that idea? After a lifetime of, of having to deal with people like this, I, I think she was just playing the game. And then meanwhile, the guy, what does he do? He asks for an autograph. He's a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but, but meanwhile, her partner is, he's seething and he wants to f- try and find somebody who's more open-minded than this panel that they had to present this uh, idea to. And she even says it here. I might as well face facts. People have a very specific idea of who I am and what they can expect from me. And that's a pinup who brings in the dough. I mm-hmm. won't let them down. So like you said, she's resigned to that fact. Again, she's smarter than any of them. And she's already three steps ahead knowing I could talk to him till I'm blue in the face, but this is the best I can do. And I'm helping the war effort. And, and, and it's so sad and tragic because, you know, this was, this was when, what year was this scene, George? Do you remember? remember? Uh, did they even say? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I don't think they put years. Ah, here we on go. Every... It's it's around 1942 because there's the they actually get a patent for this frequency hopping 
uh, invention. Forty two, and it's August, some uh, August eleventh, I think, nineteen forty two. Okay. So, nineteen forty two, she has she has resigned herself to her position in life based on how she's perceived by by uh, basically uh, the male hierarchy. And uh, what what could she have accomplished had she, had had she not been pushed aside, right? And and uh, stepped on back then. What what if they what if the Navy had taken her invention and actually applied it? And what else you know? Because she it wasn't you know even though she resigned herself to basically her fate, um, she didn't stop inventing. She she still kept her uh, no or she filled her notebook with with inventions but she didn't really do anything with it after that and then right. the basically the rest of the book is in fact i think don't we skip a bunch of time here yeah what winds up happening is and now we're bringing ourselves to let's see what page so we're already in, around page 130 and what is this about about 170 174 pages, pages yeah so we only have 40 pages left and, and we We've gotten to the height of her career. We're in the middle of World War II. Mm -hmm. And there are two, well, maybe even three instances where other people are telling us what happened in her life. Yeah. Uh, And one of them happens very shortly after this, where after she sets records selling bonds and she has an opportunity to be in Casablanca. Oh, that's right. Casablanca is being produced by another uh, film company and they they would like her to to get out of her contract or at least borrow her to make this film they won't let her and they look at it as a whether they look at it as a second rate she was already in a movie called algiers early in her career and they looked at this as the uh, second rate algiers well how many people remember Algiers and how many people remember mm-hmm. Casablanca, right? <laughs> so she had the opportunity to be in Casablanca. And instead she's in a movie called white cargo, which I think was the first film that got panned or, or at least the first film we see get panned by the critics. And instead of originally the, the people sitting in the audience, the critics in the audience are blaming the, the film studio. They very quickly blame her for doing the film and that she's just taking any role now so already now you see how uh, public opinion may be changing on this star uh, the, the the star fades a, a, a new star comes along you know that kind of thing is always that story in hollywood mm-hmm. right that's so yeah, this is kind of the beginning of that yep uh, but then later on we get two people at a, at a diner talking about her and then you get somebody who's doing a tour on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, talking about her, letting you know, catching you up, almost uh, a bunch of exposition so that uh, we can skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, and and that's, that. I will say that that kind of jarred me when I was reading yeah. this. Like, I, we mm-hmm. were just getting into some really good in, uh, information about her life and how it was impacting her. And, and there, you know, there's there's actually a scene between her and Mayer again after the, the 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 white cargo movie in Casablanca thing, where she's telling him she wants to be a producer, and he laughs at her, right, and and says, "You can't change Hollywood, doll." And this is another a, another great visual. Mm-hmm. You turn the page, and there's a splash page of the Hollywood sign. Excuse me, the Hollywood Land signed sign, mm-hmm. where it's they're 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 changing it. Uh, they're taking down the land part to to uh, presumably or maybe things are starting to fall apart so they're they're doing some renovation right but it is changing <laughs> yeah b- b- but uh notice the vulture flying up uh, above it <laughs> mm-hmm. some great commentary there with with nothing but the visual to to tell that so but then yeah after that then you get these conversations and and I'm like oh we just got to the good stuff and right. and then they skip you know, ten years, uh, and then it's then it's into the uh, the seventies or the eighties. I forget now. You know, yeah. Well, just... these are actually dated uh, after the Hollywood land the, the the land part from Hollywood Land comes down. They skip to nineteen fifty seven, which is where the book opened out with the What's My Line. It oh, opened okay. in nineteen fifty seven, but now it's a little later in nineteen fifty seven, and Mayer has died. Yes, and th- this is the part where two critics are sitting in a diner after the funeral. 
talking about Hedy Lamar. Then you skip ahead 20 years to 1977 to the tour guide, the sleazy tour guide of the Hollywood Walk of Fame <laughs> talking about catching us up over the past 20 years yeah. in and, Hedy Lamar's life. And the, the, the uh, supposed autobiography that she later claimed she didn't write. Mm-hmm. Uh, and did you notice in here towards the end of his spiel, I think, let's see, what, what page was that on? Yeah, page 145. Oh, maybe that was in the previous scene. Oh, it was. It's with the uh, the, the two folks, the, the two critics you're talking about. And as they leave the restaurant, there's a poster with Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, yes, ex- thank mm-hmm. you. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the new flavor, uh, yep, right? Exactly. And so I find, mm-hmm. that, I find that very curious considering what we're, what we're going to talk about later. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, that's what I was thinking about. In the next scene on page 153, uh, one of the tourists asks, uh, what is she, what is they, what do they say? Uh, they ask where Marilyn star is yes. on the, on the <laughs> Hollywood Walk of Fame. So, but yeah, we get a lot of, a lot of exposition here and then we get to the end of the story, which yeah. is, uh, someone from the electronic frontier foundation, the EFF calling Hedy, Hedy's son, Anthony. Mm-hmm. Basically, in, one in 1996. Was it 96? Mm-hmm. Okay. She, she would have been eight, about 82 at the time. Yeah. So uh, they want to present her with an award for her invention, uh, which, mm-hmm. which then, like, like, you know, like we said, uh, eventually became what we now know as Wi Fi. And so uh, this, this, this last scene that we see her in, I thought was very well done. You know, she's, like you said, she's, what, 80 something? Mm-hmm. And, uh, the son is saying, well, first of all, he's, he, he, apparently he's just now discovering that she's, she's, she has all these inventions, right? You filled up all these pages with ideas for inventions. You never talked about it. And, and he, she said, and so we, we only see her hair. She's facing this shaded window. Meh. It was a hobby, sort of like a secret garden, she says. Mm. And then we see her, uh, we see the front of, uh, or see her face, and it's all in shadow, uh, with with slats of light through coming through the window, through the shaded window. But you know, uh, her face looks a little off, and that's because apparently she's had some surgeries done. But she's hiding. She's she's hiding, literally hiding in the dark mm-hmm. from her past, uh, which I thought was just so unfortunate, and and it's kind of heartbreaking. So the son basically tells her all this stuff and essentially convinces her to go accept this award, this this recognition, right? And as she's as she says that, so I'll gladly accept this one. It makes up for what people refuse to see in me for so long. Validation, right? And I love this, George. The son is slowly opening up the shade to let the light in as she's saying yep. this. What a great, what a great visual. But then she, the, you know, the light sh- is shining in. We clearly see her face. She's looking at this picture of her and George Anthel. But then she notices her, notices her face in the mirror. Mm-hmm. And then it all comes crashing down again. And it, so she tells her son, you'll accept the award on my behalf. I can't show this face in public. So tragic. And then we, so then we get to uh, the end, near the end of the book. Uh, she's died, and and the son and her daughter go back to Vienna. And I forgot to mention this at the, at the beginning. They they scatter her ashes in the same field that we saw in nineteen nineteen or nineteen twenty nine. Yep, nineteen nineteen nine. Mm-hmm. When her and her father would go through walking through the woods uh, uh, during their talks, mm-hmm. and so that was a nice uh, a nice uh, uh, callback to that. And then, uh, the next page, they show her headstone in the cemetery. And I, I don't know if, uh, again, maybe I'm just making connections there that really aren't there, George, but, but, uh, the, so we have her headstone, we have some flowers, and then we've got these poles coming up with these little white bulbs on them. That reminded me of her in that scene that we talked about earlier uh, with, yes. with the stars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it also, to me, it kind of evokes, like 
signals coming out of the ground Mm -hmm. into the sky, you know, kind of like Wi-Fi. (laughs) Right. I know I'm re- I'm reaching. <laughs> oh, I wonder if there are 88 of those little balls. Ooh, I did not think of counting them, George. I, well, I, I don't I think mean, so. I, I, I don't either. At least not in the picture. But <laughs> it would be interesting. It would be interesting to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then finally, the book does end with uh, someone watching a 1969 interview with Hedy Lamarr on the Merv Griffin show, and they're watching it over Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we see the camera starts to pull back from the video to the guy watching the video to the guy in the crowd at at this Wi-Fi cafe. I'll just say it is to the signals coming off of uh, a a tower in Hollywood. the The signals continuing on. We keep pulling the camera out uh, in this scene. The, the the signal coming out of Los Angeles, and then we start to see where the satellite is that that receives and and sends that signal and then we finally get the final the 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 last page of this which is the planet earth amongst the sea of stars that we saw earlier when a mayor said that he would make her a star Mm -hmm. uh i i like the imagery of that the the connection between the two i hate the fact that it was mayor it was a scene with mayor that, that they, they put that part in because, uh, I don't want, I don't want any, I don't want her to have any connection to the guy, (laughs) but you know, he, regardless of what we think of him, he did allow her to pursue some of these things that, that were hers. Uh, not that she couldn't have done it, uh, on her own, but I, maybe it would have been harder. She wouldn't have had the, the resources, the money, uh, just the connections too. Maybe she would never, never have gotten together with George Anthel to come up with the the frequency hopping thing. Uh, given that she, you know, if she weren't weren't the the Hollywood star that she was, I don't, you know, it's just the the fate and all that, uh, how that all plays into something like this. You know, it's just it's hard yeah. to say, but as, you know, I I just I I I really found this 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 book George to be a, a fascinating portrait of this beautiful but also vain, but brilliant woman. Mm. And, and we, I've, I've touched on what I, a lot of the things I liked about, about the, the, the visual storytelling of this book. So I, I, you know, I, I, I really, really enjoyed reading this. Yeah. And as the headstone says, films have a certain place in a certain time period. Technology is forever. So, so that is the epitaph on a, on a headstone for an actress, a very intelligent woman who, if she had been, she had been looked at for more than just her looks and her artistic talent. Boy, can, can you imagine some of the other things that maybe would have graced all our lives besides for her, her acting? Yeah. The inventions that, that, and who knows, maybe her, her children did do something to try to at least patent some of her inventions and maybe they're just sitting there and, and nobody's doing anything with them. You never know. Mm-hmm. And that is the end of part one of our humanoids discussion. Please join us for part two, where we cover the twilight man and Maryland's monsters. Contact me, leave feedback on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Gmail at Longbox Review. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.